Cartier, low drawings at the brick, he felt that he had to begin by recognizing his audience. I can almost hear some of you sighing. No, not Tiepolo again. Going on to note, Tiepolo has been turned upside down, inside out, bisected, dismembered, scrutinized, and then nicely put together again. Schultz did not want to contribute, he said, to the already too much overgrown mass of Tiepolo research. That back in 1973. Colin persisted, though, so after a while I stopped and thought about it. And I remembered, back to 2016, when the great Tiepolo scholar Bill Bartram was the Thaw Senior Fellow in our Drawings Institute. And Bill focused just on drawings for one project, the Palazzo Clerici in Milan. And he crafted an amazing lecture about Tiepolo's working drawings for that project. Some of you I know were here for that lecture, it's still online for those who are not. Just Google Archam, Tiepolo, and Morgan. Now, Bill made it clear that there was still more to say, even about the clergy drawings, maybe the most often discussed in the scholarship, certainly the most beautiful examples that have been exhibited again and again. But remember this, remembering this, I thought, okay, fine. Maybe it is worth thinking about a Tiepolo exhibition. And in the end, one section of the show goes back to Bill's work clustering a set of drawings around the oil sketch for the clergy ceiling, borrowed, as Colin mentioned, from the Kimball. So for example, here's this lively, exuberant even, study of Apollo, featuring the god hovering directly over our heads. It's an early idea, though Tiepo then had to temper the bodiness of the drawing a bit in the oil sketch by employing some artful drapery. He then, in any case, changed the figure completely in the final fresco that you see at the bottom. So there's a sheet done early in the process. But this amazing drawing, with three views of Bacchus, seems to have been done after the oil sketch. As you see, the top drawing corresponds very closely to the standing figure in the sketch. But then Tiepolo kept working at it, changing it from a standing figure to one reclining, to one sprawling, almost collapsed, and appropriately for the god of wine, he reclines even more lewdly in the final fresco, with the great straw-covered fiasco of wine between his legs. So part of the exhibition's story is thus to show Tiepolo's working practice, how he moved from drawings to sketches, back to drawings, and then on to the final painting, how this was a messy, organic, creative design process even if those studies seem effortlessly created. But then going beyond Bill Bartram's work for the clergy ceiling, it took not much looking before Ian Hicks and I began to realize something else promising, which is that despite all of those Tiepolo exhibitions, it has been for the most part the same 20 or 30 drawings that have featured in all of them, the same greatest hits exhibited again and again. Some of these, like the amazing drawing for a ceremonial mace at left, we had to include in this show. It's just too good to pass up. But others, like this striking head in red chalk wash, something that looks almost as likely to be by Boucher as by Tieblo, has not been exhibited in all of its years here at the Morgan. It was still in the album in which it arrived here at the institution. And beyond those that had been exhibited or not, and despite the fame of the Morgan's Tiepolo collection, we barely had dates or other information in our cataloging records for nearly half the drawings in this set. Now, in terms of a methodology, it's also worth noting that I was at the same time working on my Piranesi exhibition, the show Colin mentioned earlier. And the idea for that project was not to borrow the 50 or 60 most beautiful Piranesi drawings from around the world a way we might well have done such a show, but instead to take a deep dive into the Morgan's collection of 150 Pyrenees to see what those told us about the artist, looking not just at the fancy drawings, but also the scrappy sketches, the fragments, the things on the backs of reused sheets. With the depth of the Morgan's holdings, we could do something similar for Tiepolo, we quickly realized. See what the drawings, the evidence of all these drawings, not just the grandest ones, told us about their working practice. So off we went, Ian and I. Uh, he had seemed 
almost immediately to absorb that vast body of literature on TA flow. And then very early in her work made a few major discoveries, one or two of which I'll talk about. I wish he could have been here tonight, but he will come back to speak in the symposium that will hold at the end of January. Anyway, thus, with Colin's nudge and Ian's help, here we are tonight at the opening of another TA flow show. Jana Schultz is not here to sigh at us, but I hope we have at least a few new things to say. The exhibition is, in the end, a survey of the drawings by John Batista and his eldest son, Domenico, and I hope that, yes, it is an entertainment and a delight simply to admire those magical performances. We cover an awful lot of ground, though, nearly a century of drawings, from John Batista's early academy drawings of around 1718 to Domenico's last works, the Punchinello drawings done in the last years before his death in 1804. And as I've noted, we do have new discoveries. For example, T.A. Flo's masterpiece is the great staircase fresco at Würzburg, one of the greatest of all European fresco projects, for which the oil sketch, seen at right, is at the Met, unfortunately not able to be borrowed. It's a rightsman picture and so can't leave the Met. In any case, for a project like this, any of his grand ceilings, Tiepo seems to have begun work with sketches in pen and ink, from which he would then make the oil modello, show that to his patrons for approval, and then begin making scores and scores of drawings to refine the figures as he moved to the full scale of the painting. But for Würzburg, despite its immense importance in his career and the attention paid to it in the centuries since it's made, there was only a single early pen and ink sketch known, this sheet at left, now at the Metropolitan, although actually at the moment in the exhibition. Ian discovered, though, two further examples, sheets that have been here at the Morgan since 1909, often published, available online on our website, but somehow never connected even to the most, the most important, the most substantial, of T.A. Blue's projects, perhaps because they're even farther from the final ceiling than they are from the Modelo figures. It's necessary to understand drawings like this as part of that long organic working process, not simply as studies that were immediately transformed into the full-scale final fresco. And then, if there were any doubt about the links between these studies and those figures in the oil sketch, then further change in the fresco, the technical work done by our conservation center, again, during the pandemic, they put every scan they had of every watermark of every drawing in the collection online, and these drawings are even on German paper. That fir tree watermark is one distinct to 18th century German paper, of which, of course, the T.A. Flo never used until they moved to Würzburg in the early 1750s. But beyond mere discoveries, as exciting as they are to scholars, the exhibition seeks to tell a rich story of how the drawings were used in the workshop, how new ideas were invented, but also how that archive of ideas, those thousands of drawings and the oil sketches that remained in the studio, how they would be reused. For example, early on in the exhibition, you come to this juxtaposition of an oil sketch from the Philadelphia Museum and two drawings from the Morgan that were made as preparatory studies for John Battista's ceiling fresco at the Church of the Jesuati in Venice, done at the end of the 1730s. Actually, the Morgan's holdings are so rich that we have a third drawing for that same project, a third alternate scheme, but one of the hardest parts of this exhibition was, in fact, cutting the list down to what could fit into a sensible show in that gallery. I was going through with one colleague earlier today and he asked, well, how many more T.A. Blows are there in the collection that aren't in the show? And a bit of math says 265. 265 more drawings still in our storerooms at the moment. Anyway, here are these studies made around 1738 for a figure flying into space. And then, almost 20 years later, having gone to Würzburg and back, John Battista and Domenico get a commission to do a grand ceiling for a church in Brescia, about 100 miles west of Venice. And suddenly, they're playing 
with these same ideas all over again. I'll go back for a second. 